preach a, a message that I think needs done. I think it's, I've been going to do this for really a couple weeks. And then uh, I planned a little today before I really departed from vacation because I think it needs done. And what I'm going to title this message today is, Why has homosexuality become so prevalent in America? It is prevalent now. It's, uh, there was an elderly man at one time told Brother Reigns, that there'll come a day when they'll walk the streets openly, and you'll be able just to point, this one, this one's homosexual, and that one's homosexual, and it'll be so prevalent in our land. Well, those days are already here. And it, it's progressively getting worse. Uh, I, there's a lot of things that just absolutely alarm me, and this is the issue that alarms me right now more than any other issue, I think, in our land. We just recently had a vote in Senate that could have been a vote to abolish homosexual marriage, and of course they needed 60 votes to get it, and they got, I believe it was, 40, 45 votes. So it, was, it fell way short of what they needed in order to bring up an amendment to ban homosexual marriage. In a lot of political jargon that I'm not even going to get into, because any time I even talk about it, I get agitated, and I'm not going to talk about it. So... Who would ever thought you'd see a day if you'd go back to our forefathers and you'd say, well, 200 years from now, our senators will be voting whether to ban homosexual marriage or not. I mean, we, that shouldn't even be an issue. But it is an issue, is it not? And it continues to be. Then, then I was trying to read through the paper, and then it, they had a, a gay march parade in Charleston. I thought, well, this gay march parade had a transvestite in a convertible and yeah, in, but I, I thought, well, it must be in Los Angeles, as in Charleston, West Virginia. That was here this past month. So, do you ever think you'd see that day? And you ever think you'd see the things that you're seeing? And I think you're going to continue to see them. And I'm not trying to be gloomy, but I just think it's going to progress. I think it's a progressive slide now. I think it's worse today than it was three years ago when I preached this message. And I think it's going to continue to slide that way. And I've got a lot of things to say this morning, so I need to get into it. Uh, what I'm going to do today, <clears throat> which is a little bit different than before, a lot different message than before, I'm going to give you five reasons why it's become so acceptable. I'm going to give you five reasons why it's become so acceptable. You write these reasons down, and then I think you're going to find that this is, this is, this is how it's happened. It happened while we slept, as usual. It's happened while God's people slept and remained silent, and just not everything is just so peachy. Uh, but it has happened. So I'm going to give you five reasons why today it has become more prevalent. <clears throat> Number one, if you want to make things acceptable, make something acceptable, you know the first way to do it? Change its name. Call it by something other than what it is. All you got to do is change its name. Uh, I'll be honest with you, they did that. With, that's already been done. They did that with abortion. That was done with abortion. Uh, you start labeling that which is in the womb of fetus, which makes it seem less than human, doesn't it? But if you label it what's in the womb as what it is, what's in the womb in the Scriptures is called a babe. So in order to, make, to take some of the awfulness of the sin off, you change its name and call it by something that is different than what it is. You don't call it sin, you don't call it wickedness, you don't call it iniquity. So what they did with homosexuality is they obviously has changed its name. Now, of course, we don't, people, the public don't call it homosexuality or sodomy or anything of that nature anymore. They call it what? Gay. A good marvelous word, which means happy, and applied it to this particular lifestyle, which is anything but happy. It really has. So you change its name and, and don't call it what the Bible calls it. Well, I'm going to give you the words that the Bible calls it. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is my standard. This is the standard of this church. If you're God's child, this is your standard. Does everybody agree with that? Charleston Gazette's not your standard. The media's not your standard. College professors is not your standard. This is the standard. All God's people say it. Has to be. So really, the opinion that matters most is this. Would you all agree with me on that? This is the opinion that matters most. And I want you to know the names, the names that God's Word calls it. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. If I wrote the wrong verses down, I hope not. But let me go ahead and give you it. Verse 22. 
I'm going to try to be really kind and I'm going to try not to yell if I can. I'm going to try not to get real emotional. I'm going to try to do all those things this morning. I'm just going to give you the Word and pray that the Holy Spirit put the punch to it. We think that our presentation's power, but I'm going to tell you, you you read when Jesus taught, He sat down most of the time when He taught. The power was in His message. It wasn't in His presentation. Okay? So that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm just going to give you the truth and just let the Holy Spirit take care of it. Y'all agree with me? What I'm going to do? You look at it. Leviticus 18:22 says, "Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is a what? It's still an abomination. It hasn't changed. God hadn't changed His opinion about that particular lifestyle. He says that when He talks about it in this text, He says that for a man to lie with a man as He does with womankind, which is describes the homosexual act in and of itself." He says that it is an abomination. So if that is true, then all across our land, there's a lot of abomination being committed and a lot of abomination being being supported uh, by many people. The stats on the number of homosexuals are inflated. They say 10% of the population is homosexuals. That is wrong. They try to do that to try to show you there's a great host of people uh, converting to that lifestyle. That was based on an infallible data. The number of Americans that are homosexual are less than 3%. It's just they're they're more out in the open now than they was years ago. That's why you notice them more, and they have more rights today than they did years ago. But less than 3%. That kind of shows you a little something. If it's less than 3%, how can they so dictate things and laws that goes on our land when by far the majority of the United States of America is against that type of lifestyle? So it's less than 10% or less than 3%. It's not 10% of the population. That's far inflated uh, from one of the writers because they want to have, show you so many people is going this way. It's not necessarily true. It's just more noticeable today than it was. Now, more people are converting to that way, but it's more accepted today than it was then. But in order to do it, you've got to change its name. You go out and call an abomination in public, then they will label you like you're a part of the Ku Klux Klan. They will call you a hate group. They'll label you a psycho. They'll label me like with that psycho preacher in uh, Topeka, Kansas. He ain't got no sense, folks. Claims to be a Baptist. He hasn't got no sense. Uh, he's got a website, and it, it lists names of homosexuals that have died, and he'll write on his website for three or 4,000 days now they've been burning in hell. And that's an abomination, too. It, it, and, and when you speak against this sin, people label you with people like that. I'm not that way. I hate that anyone goes to hell. I want homosexual people to recognize their sin and trust the Messiah and change their life. I think they need the gospel being taken to them and things of that nature. But being like he is, he is it's the same one that came up here and picketed the miners', the miners uh, funerals in uh, Sago. Uh, uh, Sago. Same, same one. I, I, see, I am getting mad when I talk about him. I was going to send him a vicious letter, but he gains his, his popularity by doing what he does. You leave somebody like him alone, he'll go away. The Bible calls it an abomination. Uh, Leviticus 20 and verse uh, 13 if any man lie with mankind, as he lies with woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Now, of course, I'm not going to well, go ahead and read the rest of, the rest of it. In Israel, uh, that was considered a capital sin. Go ahead and read the rest of the verse, verse 13. It says, and, and they shall surely be put to death, and their blood shall be upon them. They say, well, are we to do No, we're not to do that. that. Those were laws, civil laws of Israel, what's governed them as a nation. We have to obey the laws of our land. But the point of the matter was, is that it was an abomination in Israel. God considered it an abomination. God still considers it an abomination. But you can't call it an abomination, can you? You get a politician to come out and say, this is an abomination. <laughs> and then they would ride him out of Washington on a rail, wouldn't they? I wish one would have enough courage. Some of them do have enough courage to stand up against it. Deuteronomy 23, we've become passive. Listen, we've become passive in our battle against it too. Deuteronomy chapter 23, 
verse 17. Just showing you what the Bible calls it so you can write it down. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, verse 17. There shall not be a whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the power of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both these are an abomination to the Lord. He calls him a sodomite. The reason why I calls him a sodomite is the prevailing sin of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, if you study about it in the book of Genesis, was homosexuality. It dominated their city. And when some homosexuality becomes prevalent in a society, it's a sign that that nation is falling apart. I surely thought I'd get an amen on that. You look at historic, uh, if you look at the world, if you had world culture as one of the reasons for the decline of the Roman Empire, was a falling apart of the moral, morals of the land. Homosexuality was very prevalent in the Roman Empire. So history even shows that that particular truth is a sign that a nation, a decline in the morals is a sign that the nation is falling apart. And folks, I'm not trying to give you any bad news this morning, but I think our land is falling apart. I think we've laid around uh, feel dumb and happy for so long that we just that sin just has become so prevalent that even God's people has become desensitized to the awfulness of sin. Really do. So they're called sodomites. If you'll turn, uh, you say, well, that's in the Old Testament. Well, Old Testament's God's Word too. Turn to the book of Romans chapter 1. Let's go to the New Testament. Romans chapter 1. It says in verse, uh, it's speaking of homosexuality. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, look at verse 24, begin there. Wherefore, God gave them up. Everybody say, God gave them up. I want to get your attention. God gave them up. All right. To uncleanliness uh, through the lust of their own hearts and to dishonor them, their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God unto a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly. So there the homosexual act is called by three words. First of all, in verse 26, it's called a vile affection. A wicked affection. An evil affection. It says it's against nature. In verse uh, 26. And then verse 27 it says it's unseemly. It's sinful. It's sinful. That's the New Testament. Uh, that's what it calls it. That's the names. Now if you say that homosexuality is against nature, if you call it a vow affection... And if you say that it's unseemly and you say it's an abomination in the public forum, it's okay me doing it here, but you do it in the public forum, well, they'll pick at your house, they'll sue you, they'll do everything in the world to you to try to keep... But what I'm saying, I'm just telling you what the Word calls it. I'm not giving you anything fancy. I am just, just went to the Scriptures and show you what the Word of God calls it. So it calls it all these things. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, I'm not going to turn there, but you can write this down and look it up later. Homosexuality is called infeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. Is that enough? I mean, that's what God's Word calls, calls the particular sin. But you have to change the name of it. If you change the name of it, then you call it something just a little bit differently, then it becomes more acceptable uh, to the public. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. I want to turn there anyway and show you something. Now, you may think me close-minded or a jerk or whatever, and I really don't care, to be honest with you. Uh, but I, I, what I want to tell you this morning, I do a homosexual more good by telling them that their lifestyle is a sin before Almighty God and some, than some person does that tells them that their lifestyle is okay. You see, in order to be saved, there needs to be repentance in people's hearts. Do you all agree? And the Holy Spirit brings about repentance in someone's heart. 
A person needs to recognize, you know, a, a drunkard needs to recognize that drunkenness is a sin. And, and for me to say, well, now, it's all right for you to be that way. That's your choice. And if you feel to do that, I mean, God loves you just the way you... No. You need to turn from your drunkenness. Repent of your sin and trust the Messiah Jesus as your Savior. And He'll change your lifestyle. He'll change your lifestyle. I want to show you a text that says this. 1 Corinthians 6, it says in verse 8, uh, Know ye not, or nay ye wrong and defraud and that your brother. Verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The what? The unrighteous won't inherit God's kingdom. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, or idolaters, or adulterers, or effeminate, effeminate is speaking of homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, and uh, an abuser of themselves with mankind is another depiction of homosexuality, and such, uh, verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. The person that picks that as their lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. Are you saying a homosexual can't be saved? No, no, no. I'm saying that they need to repent and trust the Messiah Jesus. The same as the whole list of those other sins that's on that list. Can a fornicator be saved? How about an adulterer? Can an adulterer be saved? Sure they can. They need to repent, though, of their sin. Turn from their lifestyle and trust the Messiah Jesus what they need to do. So you don't do them any good by telling them they're okay. You might think you're politically correct and such a wonderful showing love. You don't show love by telling a sinner he's all right when he's wrong wrong. If you was driving towards Plymouth, Plymouth down here and there was a chasm and a 400 foot drop and you were driving towards it, would I, would I be, what kind of man would I be if I go to you and, and you roll you? Now, you're okay, just stay on this road. It might make them feel all right at the time. Or would I, listen, there's a chasm here. If you don't change the road you're on, you're going to fall in it. You need to repent and trust the Messiah, and He'll change your lifestyle. And He has many homosexuals' lifestyle today. But it don't come by telling them they're okay, it comes by showing that what they're doing is wrong and sinful. And the Holy Spirit takes that message and brings about repentance in their heart. And they trust the Messiah. And He changes their life as He changed changed many other people's lives. The book of Ezekiel chapter 3 says that we have a response. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 3. If I go too long, I'll stop. I'm not going to go too long. Try not to. I said, I don't want to yell. I just want to be... uh, Ezekiel chapter 3. Let's turn to the text. Verse 18 says, When I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not a warning. Mark this verse of Scripture. If I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and you don't give him a warning. It means you have a responsibility to give someone that's living a wicked lifestyle. You have a responsibility to give them a warning, Jim. Die. That's what it says. And thou givest him not a warning, nor speakest to him to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I'll require of thy hand. You have a responsibility to warn the wicked from their way. And you dancing around the issue and, and, and acting like it's not a sin when the Bible clearly says it is and says that those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom and acting like they're all right does them no good. You need to call it what the Bible calls it. You need to be kind and give them the gospel. Share the message with them. Share the way with them. It's your responsibility as a Christian. For crying out loud. You need to act as if that homosexual person is in your family. If they were in your family, you certainly want someone to warn them and you would certainly want someone to share with them the way and you certainly would want someone to show them a little kindness. We've changed its name. We've done that nationwide. It's homosexual, sodomites, an abomination. It's all those things. But it's not called gay, but they changed the name to desensitize to how bad it is. It becomes more acceptable. That's the first thing you do to make something acceptable is you change its name. They've done it with a lot of other sins, too. They don't call cohabitation 
They call living together cohabitation. That even sounds professional. That's called fornication. But you change its name. You call it by something else, and then it don't sound as bad. It takes the awfulness of it off. Call it what God's Word calls it. And don't be ashamed to call it that. Number two. I think the next thing you do is to make something acceptable. And, and I think the second reason why homosexuality has become, not only we change its name, but the second thing that's happened is we, you put it before people's eyes constantly. You let people see it. Television's done that. All these sitcoms has got a token gay couple on or a gay person. And if you watch it, shame on you. If you didn't watch it, they couldn't show it and wouldn't show it because they heard them in the pocketbook. Will and, Will and who? Homosexual. Depicting of a homosexual. We didn't watch the movie that had Mike Dickey in it about soccer. Had that goofy comedian in it that played Elf. I don't know what his name is. I went and watched that, and I thought, well, this is a good, maybe a good family thing to see. You know, you want to go went to that, and here you have the soccer coach, and all the soccer parents is coming out, and they, here comes one soccer, uh, here comes one soccer group, and there's two women has their child too. I thought, for crying, for crying out loud, and they constantly put that before your eyes. You know why they put it before your eyes, brother Bill, so much? It takes the awfulness of the sin off. You get to where they know their name, where you know their name. You feel like you're, they're your buddy? And it don't seem like it's so bad? Psalms 101.3 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Because if you set wickedness and watch it long enough, it desensitizes you to how bad that it is. That's what they've done with homosexuality. All these shows, the token shows and movies depict them. And then when they, what they did in the beginning is when they put the homosexual in the shows, they put them in such a way so you'll laugh at them. You'll think it's funny. Look, the proverb says that fools make a mock at sin. It's not funny. If you want to make something acceptable, you put it before people's eyes all the time. And by doing that, by pointing it before their eyes all the time, then it'll desensitize them to how bad sin is. Listen to this statement. An increasing number of gays and lesbians have come out of the closet in recent decades and going public with their sexual orientation. Coming out is a risky process. However, this has vastly increased the percentage of North Americans who personally know at least one gay or lesbian. A Kaiser, a Kaiser, I don't know how you say that, Kaiser Family Foundation survey in the year 2000 showed that among those who don't know any homosexuals, 68% agreed with the statement that homosexuality is morally wrong. Among those who know a homosexual as a personal friend, the percentage, the percentage dropped to 47%. So if you put their lifestyle constantly before your eyes, your opinion of it as being a sin will drop over a period of time. I guarantee it. That's how Satan works. Number three, got to remove accountability for it. Everybody loves to blame their sin on somebody else. Does everybody understand that? I believe people are sinners. Of course, she was born a sinner. I realize that we all were. But I believe people sin because they choose to do so. I think that's a choice they make. Everybody loves to blame their sin. I, I like when they when they visit prisons and interview all these these uh, habitual, continual, lifetime criminals, and they always blame it on somebody else. They need to blame it on themselves. That's a choice they make. Choices that, 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 that they there needs to be accountability. Well, if you're going to make something acceptable, you got to remove the accountability for it. And do you realize that the accountability for homosexuality has been moved? There is no accountability for homosexuality because, first of all, it's not recognized as a sin no more because they changed its name. One reason, it's not recognized as a sin no more. But the second thing they've done, and this is the thing that uh, scares me more than anything else. I've got a lot of things to read you, but I'm just going to keep rolling. You're born that way. You're born that way. And there's a lot of politicians hold that point of view. I listen to them, hear them say it all the time. That is clearly wrong. They are not born that way, folks. That's a learned behavior. Some of the gay scientists have looked exclusively to try to find a homosexual gene. Next thing I know, I told you this last time, I told you I'm not a prophet and I'm not. But I told you last time I covered this when I dealt with this particular issue, that it won't be long till they find a drunk gene. 
I'm telling you, you'll remember. You look in the, it wasn't about six months later in the Gazette. Scientists has found drunk gene. All it is is trying to remove accountability for sin that you choose to do. Folks, they have never, never, ever found a homosexual gene. Bible is our standard. And I, I, I have all the, all the research. Uh, even the guy that done the research, what made this popular... I don't think I'm going to read it. I'll set it up here, but uh, you can look at it later. What he said is that the scientist said we may have found a gay gene. May. Everybody say may. may. I may find a million dollars. That don't mean I found it. And then the papers got it and publicized it, but it's, it's already done its damage. They circulated a lie. They didn't find a homosexual gene. They tried to find it by, I forget how many identical twins who come from the same gene pool. They did a study of identical twins have the same DNA. So if it's really something you inherited, and then you got a hundred uh, homosexual identical twins, then if, if they inherited that, then then what does that mean? All a hundred percent of those will be homosexual. The study showed that fifty percent of them was, which is a clear that it didn't have nothing to do with has nothing to do with your birth. Born that way. God made them that way is another thing I hear said all the time. God didn't make them that way. God wouldn't make something that's an abomination to Him. That's an offensive thing in the eyes of God and God's people. They weren't born that way, folks. It's a learned behavior. There's a lot of contributing factors to it. I'm going to uh, share something. Uh, they did a study of homosexuals in this book. None of... None of uh, None of these diseases. And one of the things they did in this book is prove that it is a learned behavior. And they did a study of homosexuals and, and pointed out certain traits that they had and certain similarities that they had in their upbringing. You know one similarity they all had? Uh, I, want to know, I want to read this to you. Not only do mothers of homosexual men share certain traits, their fathers also share certain characteristics. Eighty-four percent of homosexuals that we study... And only 18% of heterosexuals reported that their fathers were indifferent or uninvolved during their childhood. What that means? In a lot of homosexual cases, what happens is their dads had absolutely nothing to do with them when they were coming up. And who they spent all of their time with was with their... You know where a little boy learns uh, learns masculine traits from, don't you? Learns it from his dad. I give you, I give you, fathers, I give you, in the book, Man in the Mirror, I give you a stat not long ago, and it was that uh, the average amount of time today, our study was done of fathers, the average amount of time that fathers spend with their sons is 30 seconds a day. Two by chance meetings of about 15 seconds each. Now, men, I don't know about, I'm getting irritated. I don't know about you, but I don't think you can impact your son spending 30 seconds a day with him. Mothers need to spend time with their sons. But they need to spend time with their dads, too, to give them a balance. In many of these cases, what they did, they spend all their time with their mothers. Their mothers giving them household chores, feminine activity, and learn feminine traits. It goes on and on. I'm not going to read all that. You can read about it. The point is, for Father's Day this morning, one of the contributed factors is they had a real macho dad that never wanted to spend no time with his child. And as he grew up, he developed more feminine traits in the way that he conducted himself. Me and I'm going to tell you something. You need to spend time with your boys. And with the family family unit falling apart in our land, many many daddies ain't there anyway. It's just, I'm telling you, it just I'm not trying to sound gloomy, but it's just that's that's one of the contributing factors to this. You make it a matter. You, you remove accountability. You make it a matter of birth. Can I ask you something? I don't think there's any more disgusting thing than a pedophile. And there ain't nothing that makes me, I can't even talk about it, it makes me so mad. When do you think they'll find the pedophile gene? Did God make them that way? Were they born that way? So where, where now the next thing on the agenda is to give them special rights? And to make it legal to give children to, to, a, to a pedophile couple? You say, well, that's a joke, that'll never happen. 
If I'd have preached this message 30 years ago, you'd never thought what has happened today would happen. There is no homosexual gene. It's a choice. It's an upbringing. And it's a sin and it's wrong and they need to repent of it and turn from it and trust the Messiah Jesus. That's not no more a birth thing than a than having a fornication gene or adultery gene or, or a drunkard. You see, when I read it, it was in a list of other sins, which means it is a sin, which we recognize all other sin is a choice, but this sin's not. And that was very intelligent on the heart of Satan to do that, because now that you've made it a matter of birth, you've made it a race issue. How many times do you listen to television where they say, whether we don't discriminate whether white, black, Straight or, they put it on the same level as a person's race. The Bible don't tell you race is a sin, but it says homosexuality is a sin. Because it's not a race. It's a, cho- it's a choice that, of course, that you make. I think that's wise in what they did on their part. If they can make it a race, they can gain governmental acceptance. They can receive minority status which has paved and opened the door wide open for them to label churches like ours because we stand against homosexuality, hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is going to happen. They'll pull our tax-exempt status because they will recognize us and a preacher like me as a hate group. They've already started those type things. You practice the homosexual lifestyle and you're a member of this church, you'll lose your membership here. We encourage you to repent of your sin. And then what happens is that's happening in churches like ours across the land, and then they bring lawsuits against the church and then the preacher. It almost happened uh, in Ashland Avenue Baptist Church in Kentucky. Removed a, a homosexual uh, man in their church and encouraged. They did it in a good way. They did it in a way to, as you're supposed to do it, to try to bring about repentance. He got a lawyer. Sent the pastor a big letter. Wanted to come to the business meeting and represent his client to the church. Pastor wrote back and said, you have no authority in this church. You have no right to address this church, nor will you have a right in to do so. And while I'm on the subject, if you're doing what, if you're getting ready to do what I think you're doing, I'll, have, I'll hand the keys for you before I cave in to you. Amen. And they never did. That's just starting called financial terrorism. They sue the preachers and try to break them financially. And that's why so many politicians are so afraid of them. So many people are afraid. They don't want to get picketed. They don't want to get labeled. They just like to go life their merry way and they don't want to make a stand on that. I've already made it a race thing. Since they've made it a race thing, I want you, I'm going to give you a graph. I'm, I'm going to move through this quickly. It says... Uh, one is left wondering what the results would, uh, would be to a survey that asks, do you personally believe that it is acceptable or not acceptable for gays and lesbians to engage in same-sex behavior? I want you to notice how the attitude has changed. In 1982, 34% says that that lifestyle was acceptable. 51% says it was unacceptable. There's a lot changed between now and 1982. It wasn't recognized as a race in 1982. It's recognized as a race today. 1992, 38% said it was acceptable. 1996, 44% said it was acceptable. 1999, 50% said it was acceptable to 46% that said it was unacceptable. See the trend in change? 2003, 54% said it was an acceptable lifestyle, and 43% says it was unacceptable. You say, what? If the trend is changing, that's because it's not viewed as a sin. That's because it's used as a birth and a race, something that people cannot help. And when a person actually adopts that point of view, they are more likely to say that it's an acceptable lifestyle and be condoning of it. They know what they're doing. And they did it. I'm going to tell you one more time this morning. There's no, absolutely no scientific support to prove that there is a homosexual gene. And I don't care if they ever find, try to say they find one right. It's the same scientist that said we came from monkeys. They're a real credible witness anyway. 
Saying scientific, said it was so scientific when it's not scientific. I'm not going to get off on that, but it's not scientific. It never was. The same group of scientists has done studies and proved they talk in mays and maybes and possibly's, which is not facts. Fact of the matter is, our standards the Word of God that calls us to sin. It's a learned behavior. I don't care what you say, you find. Let God be true, and every man a liar. Number four, you want to gain acceptance, you get governmental, your government support. They did that with, they've done, done that with evolution. We're looking back at that. Same scientific group. Not the same, but different scientists come forth and said and, and, and supported the so called theory of evolution. A theory, not a fact. Against the Word of God. It takes glory to do God for creation, throws it out the chance. We're reaping the benefit of that too. Raising a generation of kids that don't know there's a God. <laughs> oh, we wonder why we've lost the standard of the Bible in their land because you know what? You cast out God. You lose his standard, too. Evolution gained governmental support, did it not? And then they took it. Once it gained governmental support, you know what they did, Eddie? They, they took our tax dollars and they put it in the school system to be taught to a captive audience. Seemed pretty wise to me. It raised generations of children that if their parents didn't teach them, grew up to think that there was no God. That it just banged into existence, which so many are turning against that today. But it gained governmental support. Brother Range, you see what I mean? It gained governmental support. And then they took our tax dollars and funded it. And now it got publicly taught to our children, a captive audience in the system. And now evolution is pretty much accepted. It's been accepted. Now people's coming down. I tell you, creation science has done a great leap in fighting against that. Many scientists are seeing the error of evolution today. Many non-Christian scientists are seeing it. Don't make no scientific sense. All right. It's already gained some governmental support. They wouldn't have had no problem passing that vote this past week if there was <laughs> if they didn't have some support. There's government. They're afraid of it. The the backers ever so militant in the way that they stand for it and fight for it, and they don't want to fight against them. So they just stand back. They don't want to commit political suicide. If they'd make a stand, I guarantee it wouldn't be political suicide. There's a silent majority. Well, it's a pretty big power in this country still yet. Governmental support. It's received governmental support because now it's being viewed as as a race. So now they'll be able to, they want the right to recognize homosexual marriage and also to be able to adopt children. It's already happened. Did you ever think, Bill, that you'd ever see that? Governmental support. Sue, and they get the right to adopt children, a homosexual couple. Something that God says is an abomination, a sin, to raise a child. To raise a child in that environment, to me, just, just is unheard of. Now... They're already beginning. I don't think they've done around. They might have done around here. I don't know. But uh, they're teaching tolerance in school. They're teaching. They got curriculum to teach and show homosexual couples to teach little children that this is okay. Uh, I'm not for taking a club and beating a homosexual to death. I think that's sinful and wrong. But their idea of tolerance is teaching little children this lifestyle is okay and acceptable. When it's not okay and it's unacceptable. And it has no business to be taught in the public school system. Leave that out. But it already has governmental support and it's already being taught. It's already happening. It's just spreading now. Last thing is you remove the standard. Romans 1 is a prophetic passage of Scripture. It says that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. In other words, it depicts a nation and a people, uh, Brother John Moore, that didn't want nothing to do with God. They knew there was a God, but they wanted nothing to do with Him. So what they did is say, we don't want nothing to do with God. And it says they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. You know what it says God did? God said, it said God gave them up. You know, the worst text could ever be for a nation is for God to give them up. For God to say, you don't want nothing to do with me? Fine. I'm removing my restraining hand. 
And buddy, when he removes his straining hand to quote a cliche, it goes to hell in a handbasket. And that's exactly what's happened. They wanted the master, the king, and his laws out of the school system. They got it. Look at the difference. It's not a lack of funding or a lack of money. It's a lack of morality and a lack of standard. They wanted God out of the system. They got him out of it. Take the Pledge of Allegiance out because it's got God in it. Can you imagine that ever happening? Not being able to pray at a football game. I was glad you still do it at Poke. I think you do it somewhere else. But not to be able to pray at a football game. Not to be able to pray at a graduation. That's the kids do it. I'm glad the kids still do that. I just can't stand the fact that it's against the law. Who ever thought? Who would have ever thought? We want God out of everything. Crying out loud came up to Christmas time. We want to call it the holiday season because we don't want to put Christ in it. That's goofy. I'm so sick of this kind of stuff. It's a trend against the king in this land, and we are biting the hand that fed us. The natural result of throwing God out is what? God removes his restraining hand, and then the book of Romans 1 tells you what you see happen. And one of the dominating sin that creeps up when God removes his restraining hand is the sin of homosexuality. It becomes prevalent and widespread. You say, well, God will bring judgment because of homosexuality. Listen to me. The prevalence of homosexuality is a sign that judgment's already began. It should chill you to the bone. It's a sign that it's done began. It's a sign that God's done this. Those are five ways, five reasons that this sin has become so prevalent in our land. That's what's happened. What we need to do, we need to pray. We need to hold politicians accountable. And watch out for the liars that speak one way to one group and another way to another. But I'm telling you, the cure ain't the politician. It's the cure is the people of God. My people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and repent of their wicked ways. And I'll hear from heaven. And I'll heal their land. That's what we need to do. It can't go on like this. I'm going to tell you today, I worry about my son's sons. I do. I think about what and what is this place going to be in 20 years. If I told you, I started pastoring here 25 years ago. If I told you 25 years ago there would be homosexual parades in Charleston, what would you have said? It's a downward slide. God had his blessings.